Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast. CRISPR-Cas9 Genome Engineering Experimental Design and Applications, presented by Daniel, Daniel Folkard, Product Manager at Horizon Discovery. I am Marjorie Torres of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Horizon Discovery. For more information about our sponsor, please visit www.horizondiscovery.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your questions into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Folkard. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Thank you very much, Marjorie. So, I'm one of the product managers at Horizon Discovery, um, and the talk today is going to be covering more information on how we use our wealth of experience in genome engineering techniques to build cellular models that can be utilized and applied in basic research, in drug discovery and development, target validation, etc. So today I'm going to introduce you to some key considerations that you need to understand and take note of when designing your experiment, um, as well as outlining some interesting applications with a few case studies. So I'll begin with a short background on what we do at Horizon, um, followed by an introduction into one of the most powerful gene engineering platforms that we use um, for our cell engineering um, and screening assays, the CRISPR-Cas9. We'll go through the key considerations to take when designing your gene engineering project. And these are the points and, and drivers that will help you find your genotype of interest faster um, and help accelerate your research. Lastly, I'll go through a few examples of how CRISPR-Cas9 um, can be applied to different areas of research, from reported cell lines um, to screening for those genotypic drivers causing your particular phenotype of interest. So Horizon was built upon gene editing technologies, um, and this remains at the core of everything that we do. We believe that gene editing underpins the route to personalized medicine, which is a keyword in, in so many different um, applications nowadays. So what we do is we edit genes um, in cell lines to build human disease models. Um, so we're the cell builders. And these models are used to gain knowledge of those genetic drivers and disease, um, and also to provide knowledge of drug targets, um, as, well, as well as patient response to those key chemotherapeutic agents. So Horizon's aim is to put the right genetics in the right model, in the right context, to provide rich insight into human disease. So as researchers working in the era of the human genome, there is now unparalleled access to genetic information that has been obtained from healthy individuals, diseased individuals, and sequenced at an exome level, a whole genome level. Um, and at Horizon Discovery, we create isogenic cell lines um, with the gene editing technologies that we'll discuss today. And we use these cell lines um, to evaluate therapeutics, um, to identify targets that may be of interest, to validate those targets, um, and also for diagnostics, um, to produce reference standards that allows control for variability in those assays to determine which patients should receive which drugs. And this has been made possible by and large by the revolution of genome engineering, um, and particularly the discovery of the use of CRISPR-Cas9. 
So the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution all began in January 2013, which was marked by a major breakthrough in, in genome engineering with four labs simultaneously engineering CRISPR-Cas9 system to induce precise cleavage at mammalian genomic loci. And this resulted in an explosion of research um, conducted across many model systems, disciplines, and fields. Um, from oncology research, um, immunotherapy, looking at embryogenesis, and then going into in vivo um, and looking at how um, this could be used in, in a person. Um, and further on around, around data handling, which is just incredible, the, the capacity that CRISPR has could, could contribute in this area. And it really is making impossible experiments possible. Um, and so until this point, broadly speaking, we had three options um, open to us to explore gene function, which are the use of patient-derived cell lines with pre-existing disease-associated mutations to study gene function. Um, and while you, patient samples are of, of incredible use, they are variable from each patient to patient. The mutations will be different from patient to patient. Um, and just the, re the source is not renewable. Once you've used it, you've used it. Um, and in terms of gene modulation, um, RNA-based, uh, RNAi-based loss of function studies were common to look at the effect of removing a gene from the system. Um, and on the converse, using overexpression um, to look into gain of function experiments. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? CRISPR-Cas9 is a genome editing tool that's able to cut double-stranded DNA in a very targeted fashion. So CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing is achieved when you transfect a cell with a Cas9 protein, and that along with a specifically designed guide RNA. So in the example here, we've used a guide RNA that is 20 base pairs long, and it's specific to your target of interest. So not every 20 base pair DNA sequence is suitable as a guide RNA, as the sequence must have an adjacent PAM motif. And the PAM motif is a three base pair sequence, which consists of an NGG sequence. And that N can be any nucleotide, but it must be adjacent to your sequence of interest. And there are a number of different um, considerations to make when you select that guide RNA, um, each of which I will go into more detail later on in the talk. So when you've transfected your cells, the guide RNA that you've designed directs the Cas9 protein to the DNA target site. And it hybridizes with its matching genomic sequence. So the Cas9 protein is now in the right place and is able to cut the double-stranded DNA. And when the cell repairs that break, errors can occur resulting in the gene knockout or the knock-in where additional genetic modifications can be introduced. So for the, on the next slide, the gene here has four exons, um, and it has a start codon in exon two. So we've designed our guide RNA to bind within exon three of the gene. So the Cas9 is directed by the guide to that target location in exon 3. It cuts the DNA and causes a double strand break. And then the system relies on the DNA damage repair pathway, which is then activated. And we use the cell's intrinsic DNA repair machinery to generate the genotypes and subsequent phenotypes that we desire. So to generate knockout cells, we will allow the double strand breaks to be repaired by the repair system with non-homologous end joining. Um, and this is an error-prone repair mechanism that often results in small insertions and deletions, which can cause a frame shift in the protein coding sequence, resulting in a premature stop sequence. In order to generate a knock-in, we co-transfect cells with a donor that contains the desired mutation. And this donor template is incorporated into the genome by a more precise DNA me repair mechanism called homology-directed repair. And the difference here is that you have a donor, 
And you design that donor with flanking homologous sequences that can direct where that particular mutation should be integrated into that double strand break induced by the Cas9. Now I've gone through the basics of CRISPR-Cas9 and, and how it works. I'm going to run through these seven key considerations that you should address before performing your experiment. Firstly, this is crucial to your experiment, and you need to choose the right cell line to use. You want to use a cell line that best models your disease and that is rigor rigorously characterized. And the importance here is because there are so many opportunities for variability in getting that targeting efficiency you're looking for. So the questions to ask yourself first are, can my cell line be transfected? Different cell lines will have different transfection efficiencies and will require different conditions. And so at Horizon, we test a number of conditions, including lip affection and different con concentrations of those reagents and also different nuclear affection techniques. And based on the experience that we've gained over the last 10 years, we have over a 90% of cell lines now with a transfection efficiency of at least 50%, which gives us an enhanced pool to progress into the next stages. So once we've transfected our cells, the next thing to ask is how we enrich that population. And so we use fact sorting with GFP to identify those cells that have been transfected. <clears throat> So once we have that pool, we need to undergo a limiting dilution. And a limiting dilution is quite a strenuous pro process on the cells, but we need to do this in order to achieve those clonal populations. So we know which ones now have the transfection and have the, the double strand breaks. And so we then go through a limiting dilution step where we test different media conditions. Um, that might be a standard media, a conditioned media, with some extra things in there. Um, and we will analyze the recovery of those cells. And in the example here, you can see that the standard media actually resulted in better recovery. And then the final part is to ask yourself whether the cell culture is homogeneous. You need to evaluate whether the morphology of those cells is as expected. And once you've characterized your cell line, you've answered those key questions to make sure that you have the best transfection efficiency and the targeting efficiency you're looking for, the next stage is to think about your gene targets. Is your modification going to affect the, the gene and is it going to affect the growth of the cell line? Will the modification be lethal to the cell? Is this a really fundamental gene to the survival? And therefore, how are you going to approach that? Um, will there be a decrease in viability in the mutant cells versus those parental cells that you started with that results in your parental cells outgrowing your mutant? And can you overcome this by tweaking your protocols and timings to perform limiting dilution a little earlier in the mutant, for example, so that you keep them at, at, at the same state? And will there be a change in the phenotype after the modification? Do you have a key phenotype that you're looking for? Um, and can you assess this in the mutant line and the parental and look for those differences? A key, really key consideration with gene engineering is making sure you understand the copy number of your gene in the cell line that you're using. So we can, in-house, in we validate this using droplet digital PCR. Um, and what this allows you to do is ensure that you have the number of cells, the number of copies per cell confirmed prior to performing the engineering. And so in a normal human cell line, we expect to have two copies of the gene in the cell. However, when you use cell lines that have been in culture for years and years, or a cancerous in nature, there can be some gene duplications and multiple copies of, of the chromosomes. So the carrier type here is for the HeLa cell line, very commonly used cell line. It's been in culture for a very long time, and you can see that it has multiple copies of many of the chromosomes. So you need to know what the copy number is beforehand, and evaluating it through droplet digital PCR will give you a quantitative answer for that. So you know the copy number of your gene now, and the next 
stage is the transcripts. Does your gene have multiple transcripts? And which ones are you targeting? Do you want to target all of them? Do you want to target only a selection of them? And there's software like Ensemble that you can compare and perform analysis to ensure that you are targeting the region that you want to. Um, and also, the pseudogenes are, are common. Um, it can be common. And so if you are aware of the pseudogene, you can look at the bioinformatics tools available to you to work out where those regions of high homology are um, and determine if you want to design your guide outside of that so that you only target your gene and not the pseudogene. And lastly, does my target gene have difficult to amplify regions? Are there poly T regions that I should be avoiding? Um, will they have high GC content? Or will there be repeat palindromic regions that you need to consider when designing those guides? And now you have that information, the next stage is to actually start designing those guide RNAs and, and choosing the ones that are most relevant to you in your experiment. What makes a good guide? Uh, you want to avoid repeat stretches. Uh, again, you can use software such as Benchling that we, we've used here that will help you evaluate the options for guide RNAs based on their on-target and their off-target score. So what you want with a, an ideal guide RNA is to have a very high on-target and a low off-target combination. And that will give you the high specificity you're looking for. If you identify a number of guides that have similar results, you might want to dig deeper into those off-targets um, and have a look at where they fall. The, you don't want them to fall into a coding region, which could result in you, your guide targeting another gene that you're not looking to investigate. And so if you have all of the off-targets which are in non-coding regions, you would want to select that over the one that had coding off-targets. So for a knockout project, when designing the guides at Horizon Discovery, we would target the first four exons. And this reduces the chances of you inducing the frame shift and still having a truncated protein existing. Um, and alternatively, if you have a gene that you know encodes a protein that has a very crucial functional domain, you could target the functional domain, introduce the frame shift here, and know that you're creating a functional knockout. For a knock-in, you want to design your guides as close as possible to the site for the insertion of the donor template. And once you've taken all of these considerations into, into account, you should always carry out validation of the guides. So this will increase your targeting efficiency and will increase the number of clones that you ultimately get out at the end. So we generate five guides, all that have similar on and off target scores. Um, we transfect those into a workhorse cell line, um, and our choice here is the HEC 293. Uh, we harvest the cells 48 hours to 72 hours post-transfection, and we lyse the cells, extract the DNA, and PCR amplify those regions of interest. Uh, the assay that we carry out to assess the, the validity and of the guide RNA and how much, how well they cut, um, is a T7 endonuclease assay. And what this does is it recognizes and cleaves imperfectly matched DNA. So with that non-homologous enjoining and with the addition of extra donors, it identifies those mismatches and it cuts the sequences, which results in smaller bands being visible on, um, on this gel. So if you, in this example, you can see that there are three columns all of which have a have cleavage sites. So guide one, three, and four, the first column there is, is a control guide. And so by not performing validation in this situation, you if you used guide the guides that did not have cleavage events, you would have a very low targeting efficiency. You wouldn't be finding the clones that you were looking for. So this really emphasizes the need to assess the cutting efficiency and the targeting for your guides. So the donor design is specific for more for the knock-ins. Um, for a knockout, you don't need to have a, a donor, but it's at this stage where you should start designing your screening strategy for how you're going to identify those small insertions and deletions that would result in those gene knockouts. 
So for a knock-in, your CAS9 um, cut site must be as close as possible to that knock-in location. And in our repair, the donor um, template that we want to use, we need to determine the screening strategy for this. And it might be targeting and sequencing a specific SNP that we're introducing, or if it's a tag, you can amplify a region where that targeted allele has the tag incorporated. And we would recommend introducing silent mutations into that PAM site, which guides that RNA, um, which will prevent the CAS9 also cutting that donor template. Um, and there are, there are different types of donors that can be used. So a plasmid um, might be more commonly used for the introduction of a reported tag, um, while the single-stranded oligo donors would be used for introducing SNPs. So in the donor design here, you want to determine your genotype um, as, as fast as possible. So for a knockout, um, you, the T7 assay might be used. You want a robust process to identify your genotype. And so this example here with a T7 endonuclease assay screen um, was an example in a, with a lethal screen. We knew that the knockout would potentially be lethal to the cells, and so we didn't expect to see too many targeted events. And on the, the figure here, you can see the stars indicate where we have found um, a target event occurring. And so if you were expecting to see a knockout efficiency um, of much higher, you may want to skip the step and, and go into uh, perform a sequencing analysis immediately. So Tide and CRISP-ID are two software um, packages that can help with the analysis of your results following your, your targeting. Um, so Tide analyzes the sequence upstream of your mutation, and it identifies the two different traces for the two copies of the gene. Uh, you can see that there's a few that say four copies. Um, this it emphasizes a non-clonal population and is likely two cells being in that well. Ideally, we want two outer frame mutations. So here you can see you've got in the orange, it highlights ones where there's an outer frame mutation and also an in frame mutation. So we need it to be out of frame to cause the frame shift and result in the stop codon. So those in green, you can see have two out of frame um, mutations. And so those are the ones that you would like to take forward. The addition of CRISP-ID, it's it's lower throughput compared to the Tide. Obviously, Tide, you could see that there was a number of different clones here that we had all of the information on. Whereas with CRISP-ID, it's, it's lower throughput, but it does add you an, an additional layer. So it gives you not only the, that there is a mutation, but it gives you the sequence, the exact sequence from that particular clone. So that's hugely valuable. And so for a knock-in screen, um, you need to add that screening strategy into your donor design, like the incorporation of a silent mutation into the PAM site, so you can just screen for those positives. Um, and there's a couple of examples here. So A has 30 positive clones, and this is a knock-in screen, and B has 162 positive clones. Now, the only difference here with, with this screen in particular is that this is exactly the same cell line, um, but it's a different gene and therefore it's a different guide RNA. And so this shows how your guide is key in affecting the targeting efficiency and how that may vary depending on the target that you are trying to, 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 you are trying to, to change and modify. So for a positive screen here, um, you can design a primer for your targeted SNP um, in the allele that you've, that, that you've edited. And so this example of 116 positive clones and 54 positive clones are using the same guide, but it's in a different cell line. And so again, this emphasizes that the cell line itself can vary in the targeted efficiency. It may have been due to the transfection um, and why those key considerations earlier in the process is a, a really important. And the final consideration we're going to go through is the validation of those cell lines. So firstly, you want to confirm your clonality. And the way in which we do that in-house is that we use a cell matrix scanner. And this scans the bottom of the plate to identify when we have one cell in each well. 
And you can see at day zero, you've got a single cell, and that's expanded through day 10. Um, and this is an example of a clonal population. Alternatively, you could use a single cell sorting um, via flow cytometry and then perform PCR on each cell. And so once you, you've confirmed the clonality, you want to confirm the, the genotype with a suite of, of, of PCRs. And so for a knockout identification, you might want to perform a PCR that is over the guy, uh, over the exon 3 mutation there. Um, and in addition, you want to perform a much longer PCR, which will allow you to see if there's been any larger deletions that you might not be able to see from that shorter PCR in your gene of interest. So for a knock-in project, um, we perform a few more PCRs, one you know, targeted allele, also looking at the non-targeted allele, which will help confirm the copy number of your gene. Um, and another way to do this would be topo cloning to individually sequence the alleles. You want to clarify that there's not been any off-target incorporation. And the way you might do this is you've performed that in silico analysis with the software to identify uh, the off-target score. So if you dig a little deeper into those, you could work out what the top 10 hits that were predicted were and then validate those to ensure that there is no, um, there's been no off-target effects and cutting with the CAS9 and the guide. The carrier type is also confirmed to ensure that it has not been affected by the gene engineering. And the cell lines are confirmed to be contaminant-free, and not just from a bacterial contamination, but also from a wild-type cell. So this comes back to the clonality of the population. You don't want to have a parental cell that's also mixed in there with your mutant, um, because it will affect the copy number and your allelic frequency of that variant. And then lastly, you want to be able to confirm the identity of that suspected phenotypic change. If you know there's going to be a reduction in cell viability or you know there's going to be a resistance to a drug now, you want to confirm that that is the case in the mutant compared to the parental cell line. And again, that emphasizes the reason at Horizon why we generate isogenic cell lines. They're exactly the same except for that key mutation that you are trying to introduce. So now we've gone through the tools and the considerations for how you design your CRISPR-Cas9 gene engineering project. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk um, describing how you can apply this technology to your research uh, with a few different examples. So reporter and fluorescently labeled cell lines can be very useful um, in research. They can tell you whether a transcription factor is on or off, um, if you have a cell service marker that's expressed, uh, you can evaluate the localization of a protein um, and also look at that in, in respect to whether it's in a particular organelle that it's expressed. And at Horizon, we've developed a protocol that allows for rapid and robust endogenous tagging um, of your joint gene of interest. So endogenously tagged genes are favored versus exogenous plasmid-based overexpression models, which can be problematic. Um, and it's much clearer uh, the absence of the non-tagged proteins reduces the complexity when you come to quantify that protein number. Um, we have, this technique is explained in, in more detail in the podcast at the link in the, in the bottom of the slide here. Um, and this technique uses CRISPR, but it also uses that non-homology end joining repair mechanism that's used in a knockout. Um, and so it doesn't require the need um, for um, a donor with homology region design. It is a one-size-fits-all donor. And so we've used Turbo GFP. And the guide RNA is designed to target the Cas9 to your particular gene of interest. Um, we've developed a suite of tagged organelles um, where we've tagged genes specifically known to be expressed in a particular cell compartment. And there's a few examples um, here. So for the endoplasmic reticulum, we have targeted CalR and also PDIA4. We have a couple of nucleic um, markers that we've, we've tagged that are specific to the nucleus, and also one for mitochondria and centrosome localization. <clears throat> and this might allow you to perform a pull-down assay or live cell imaging um, of those proteins without having to, to fix your cells and extract, and et cetera. 
So the next application I'm going to go through um, are about genetic screens. I'm going to start with forward genetic screens here. Um, and this is an approach to identify genes or a set of genes that are responsible for a particular phenotype. So you use mutagenized cells um, to identify your phenotype, and then you identify the mutations subsequent to that that have resulted in that phenotype. So this is important in positive selection. So you have cells that have been transduced with the Cas9 protein and a library of guide RNAs. So the cell population then undergoes selection, which might be treatment with a drug or a cell surface marker to positively select them. Um, and so all the cells that then remain will have the phenotype that you're looking for. So with the drug treatment, for example, it would be the resistance to the drug. And so those remaining viable cells um, would be selected. The examples here um, are of essential genes that are in cancer immunotherapy effector functions. And what this, this group did was to transfect melanoma cells with around 125,000 guide RNAs, which were specific to 20,000 genes. And these cells were then treated with T cells to induce T cell phytotoxicity, which is expected. And so those cells that were survived the treatment with the T cells were then collected and sequenced to identify the genes that conferred uh, the resistance to this cytotoxicity. Um, this group used three different techniques. Um, with the same candidates that were identified, and they pulled out one in particular, the APLNR, which the key candidate identified and confirmed to be important in the resistance. It's a G-protein coupled receptor, and it's involved in interfering gamma secretion via the JAK-STAT pathway. And it was within this pathway that the ANLPR um, was believed to work through. So this emphasizes the, the usefulness of these genetic screens um, where you know what the phenotype is that you're looking for, but you want to know how you were getting there and what genes were responsible for that. And so re reverse genetic screens are the same, but slightly different. Um, so the reverse genetic screens are where you're investigating the phenotype of an organism following the disruption of a known gene. So you know the gene this time and you want to work out what phenotype that confers. So it's the opposite approach to the forward genetic screen. And so with these genetic screens, you can perform transcriptional analysis. Um, and at Horizon, we have created um, thousands of HAP1 um, knockout cell lines. So we know what the genes are, um, and we wanted to evalu evaluate the phenotypes by looking at the expression difference in that RNA-seq profile. So we have treated the cells with um, a number of different stimuli. You extract the RNA and then performed RNA-seq on those cells. So different stimuli produce stimuli-specific expression signatures. And those stimuli that were similar um, resulted in more closely related expression signatures. So we went on to use 64 of our knockout cell lines um, that were all important in tyrosine kinase signaling with 10 different stimuli. So we know the genetic mutations. Um, and then we then profiled those through RNA-seq. And we were able to recapitulate known genetic dependencies. So of the signature of the responses, we were able to identify the response in, to the interferon gamma. Um, so in A and B, the figures here, you can see that interferon gamma, there was, there was no response. And, the, and there was no JAK1 response, which is exactly what we expected, given that the cell line we were studying was the JAK1 knockout line. And the same principle was found with the FGFR1, where FGF1, uh, the ligand for this, um, saw no downstream um, activation. And so this technology in the suite of thousands of different HAP1 knockout cell lines that we have available is hugely valuable when you're trying to evaluate uh, the gene responsibility and the function. So now I'm going to switch gear just a little. Um, and I'm I'm going to give you an introduction into CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I. So CRISPR-A is CRISPR-mediated transcriptional activation, and CRISPR-I is CRISPR-mediated transcriptional repression. So the hypothesis for these adapted CRISPR techniques was to use dead Cas9. 
And what I mean by that is that it's catalytically inactive. Um, it's deactivated and so no longer has that endonuclease activity that we've seen in the previous slides where it can cut that double-stranded um, DNA. So it still uses the guide RNA, but instead it uses the guide to take it to that target location, but the dead Cas9 um, is, is targeted there to, say, a promoter region that it can it activates or inhibits um, the transcriptional, transcriptional acti activity of the promoter. So with CRISPR-R, you use a dead Cas9 with or without a transcriptional inhibitor um, KRAB domain to complex with the guide RNA and to target promoter regions to cause transcriptional repression or knockdown of the gene. And alternatively, the dead Cas9 can fuse to transcriptional activators and targeted to the promoters to increase the expression. Uh, in terms of the requirements for the guide RNA design for CRISPR-I, it needs to be in close proximity to that gene's promoter region to result in the gene being silenced. Versus with the CRISPR-A, the guide RNA, what we want is to design it in close proximity to the gene's transcriptional start site to result in gene activation. And so this next couple of slides are going to look at applying a genome-wide CRISPR screen um, to identify long non-coding RNA loci that were regulating a gene neighborhood causing resistance to chemotherapeutic reagents. And long non-coding RNAs have critical roles in diverse cellular processes um, and are notoriously difficult to study in an endogenous setting as they are hard to transcriptionally regulate and therefore is a really good application for CRISPR-I and CRISPR-A. It is a similar setup to a forward genetic screen in that you induce the cells uh, with a CRISPR-A library, which is designed to around 10,000 transcriptional start sites for the long non-coding RNAs. Um, the selection is then applied, which is those chemotherapeutic agents. Um, and those that had resistance were selected and their transcriptional profile was investigated. And in C he there were a number of different candidates along non-coding RNAs that were mediating the resistance. And in this figure, they identified MOB3B as a key candidate and was able to confirm its role in the clinic as well. Um, and so this demonstrates a huge amount of power to these CRISPR-A screens by really getting the most out of your data and identifying new key targets that you haven't even considered previously and little nodes in, in a particular pathway of interest to you. And this is just some additional data showing how there was a difference between uh, the controls and the treated and also how that, what that expression profile looked like um, with respect to sensitivity and resistance to the chemotherapeutic agent. So if you want to know more about CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I screens, how you may do them in tandem and what sort of data that you can achieve um, from these, uh, we recently hosted a webinar with Dr. Benedict Cross from Horizon, who's our CRISPR-A and I expert. Um, he provides more detail on how we've used these CRISPR adaptive techniques in-house, um, and the link here will enable you to access this recording. So to wrap up, I'd like to thank you all for listening to the talk today um, and leave you with some final messages about how at Horizon, we are the gene editing experts and we're con constantly pushing the boundaries of CRISPR genome engineering in our screening applications and in development of cellular models for basic research into drug development and mechanistic un understanding. And with that, um, I would like to welcome any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Danielle Folkord, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your questions into the box that appears on your screen and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, is CRISPR going to take over from modulation techniques such as siRNA, or is there a place for both techniques? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, both CRISPR and um, siRNA have their own advantages and disadvantages uh, where 
CRISPR can provide you with, say, a clear approach of knocking out your gene completely. Um, it allows you to really understand the mechanisms that it's involved in. There's no residual gene expression at all, um, and you, you can compare it to the parental. While the siRNA is a more delicate modulating approach um, rather than editing it directly. So I, th I think there is place for both techniques. Um, and even in combination where you use CRISPR plus a modulator to assess and more, more deeply interrogate those pathway interactions. Uh, for example, in synthetic lethality where um, you may need a, an additional level of understanding. Thank you for that answer. Our next question is, what is the knockdown or knockoff level with CRISPR information architecture? I, so sorry. With, with CRISPR I and A, um, the, the change in gene expression that we see with these tools um, is partially influenced by the locus that you are that, that, that you're interested in um, and its its area. Again, it's thinking about all of those different things that we spoke about in the talk about the, the GC rich and all of those um, considerations. Uh, the targeting efficiency of the cells um, and, and also the baseline expression level. Uh, but overall, we would expect to see a, around tenfold changes um, in the gene expression at most loci. I would like to once again thank Danielle Folkard for her presentation. I would also like to thank Horizon Discovery for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through December 2017. You will receive an email from Labrys letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share the announcements with your colleagues who have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.